Chapter Twenty Seven of A Daughter of the Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Campbell Shelp. A Daughter of the Land by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter Twenty Seven Blue Ribbon Corn. Never in her life had Kate worked harder than she did that fall, but she retained her splendid health. Everything was sheltered and housed, their implements under cover, their stock in good condition, their storeroom filled, and their fruits and vegetables buried in hills and long rows in the garden. Adam had a first wheat premium at the county fair, and a second on corn, concerning which he felt abused. He thought his corn scored the highest number of points, but that the award was given another man because of Adam's having had first on wheat. In her heart, Kate agreed with him, but she tried to satisfy him with the blue ribbon on wheat and keep him interested sufficiently to try for the first on corn the coming year. She began making suggestions for the possible improvement of his corn. Adam was not easily propitiated. Mother, he said, you know as well as you know you're alive that if I had failed on wheat or had second, I would have been given first on my corn. My corn was the best in every way, but they thought I would swell up and burst if I had two blue ribbons. That was what ailed the judges. What encouragement is that to try again? I might grow even finer corn in the coming year than I did this, and be given no award at all, because I had two this year. It would amount to exactly the same thing. We'll get some more books, and see if we can study up any new wrinkles this winter, said Kate. Now cheer up, and go tell Milly about it. Maybe she can console you, if I can't. "'Nothing but justice will console me,' said Adam. "'I'm not complaining about losing the prize. "'I'm fighting mad because my corn, my beautiful corn, "'that grew and grew and held its head so high "'and waved its banners of triumph to me with every breeze, "'didn't get its fair show. "'What encouragement is there for it to try better the coming year? "'The crows might as well have had it.' or the cutworms, while all my work is for nothing. "'You're making a big mistake,' said Kate. "'If your corn was the finest, it was. "'And the judges knew it, and you know it, "'and very likely the man who has the first prize knows it. "'You have a clean conscience, and you know what you know. "'They surely can't feel right about it, or enjoy what they know. "'You have had the experience,' You have the corn for seed, with these things to back you. Clear a small strip of new land beside the woods this winter, and try what that will do for you. Adam looked at her with wide eyes. By Jing, mother, you are a dandy, he said. You have just bet I'll try that next year. But don't you tell a soul. There are more than you who will let a strip be cleared in an effort to grow blue ribbon corn. How did you come to think of it? Your saying all your work had been for nothing made me think of it, she answered. Let them give another man the prize when they know your corn is the best. It's their way of keeping a larger number of people interested and avoiding the appearance of partiality. This contest was too close. Next year, you grow such corn that the corn will force the decision in spite of the judges. Do you see? I see, said Adam. I'll try again. After that, life went on as usual. The annual Christmas party was the loveliest of all, because Kate gave it loving thought, and because all of their hearts were especially touched. As spring came on again, Kate and Adam studied over their work, planning many changes for the better. But each time they talked, when everything else was arranged, they came back to corn. More than once, each of them dreamed corn that winter while asleep. They frankly talked of it many times a day. 
location, soil, fertilizers, seed, cultivation. They even studied the almanacs for a general forecast of the weather. These things brought them very close together. Also, it was admitted between them that little pole grappled them with hooks of steel. They never lacked subjects for conversation. Paul always came first, corn next, and during the winter there began to be discussions of plans for Adam and Millie. Should Millie come with them, or should they build a small house on the end of the farm nearest her mother? Adam did not care, so he married Millie speedily. Kate could not make up her mind. Millie had the inclination of a bird for a personal and private nest of her own, so spring came to them. August brought the anniversary of Nancy Ellen's death, which again saddened all of them. Then came cooler September weather, and the usual rush of preparation for winter. Kate was everywhere and enjoying her work immensely. On sturdy, tumbly legs little Paul trotted after her or rode in state on her shoulder when distances were too far. If Kate took her to the fields, as she did every day, she carried along the half of an old pink and white quilt, which she spread in a shaded place and filled the baby's lap with acorns, wild flowers, small brightly colored stones, shells, and whatever she could pick up for playthings. Paul amused herself with these until the heat and air made her sleepy. Then she laid herself down and slept for an hour or two. Once she had trouble with stomach teeth that brought Dr. Gray racing and left Kate white and limp with fear. Everything else had gone finely and among helping Adam, working in her home, caring for the baby, doing whatever she could see that she thought would be of benefit to the community and what was assigned her by church committees, Kate had a busy life. She had earned, in a degree, the leadership she exercised in her first days in Walden. Everyone liked her, but no one ever ventured to ask her for an opinion unless they truly wanted it. Adam came from a run to Hartley for groceries one evening in late September, with a look of concern that Kate noticed on his face. He was very silent during supper, and when they were on the porch as usual, he still sat as if thinking deeply. Kate knew that he would tell her what he was thinking about when he was ready, but she was not in the least prepared for what he said. "'Mother, how do you feel about Uncle Robert marrying again?' he asked suddenly. Kate was too surprised to answer. She looked at him in amazement. Instead of answering, she asked him a question. "'What makes you ask that?' "'You know how that Mrs. Southey pursued him one summer. "'Well, she's back in Hartley, "'staying at the hotel right across from his office. "'She's dressed to beat the band. "'She's pretty as a picture. "'Her car stands out in front all day, "'and to get to ride in it and take meals with her, "'all the women are running after her. "'I hear she has even had Robert's old mother out for a drive. "'What do you think of that?' think she's in love with him, of course, and trying to marry him, and that she will very probably succeed. If she has located where she is right under his eye, and lets him know that she wants him very much, he'll, no doubt, marry her. But what do you think about it? asked Adam. I've had no time to think, said Kate. At first blush, I'd say that I shall hate it, as badly as I could possibly hate anything that was none of my immediate business. Nancy Ellen loved him so. I never shall forget that day she first told me about him, and how loving him brought out her beauty, and made her shine and glow as if from an inner light. I was always with her most, and I loved her more than all the other girls put together. I know that Southey woman tried to take him from her one summer not long ago, and that he gave her to understand that she could not, so she went away. If she's back, it means only one thing, and I think probably she'll succeed, but you can be sure it will make me squirm properly. I thought you wouldn't like it, he said emphatically. Now understand me, Adam, said Kate. I'm no fool. 
i didn't expect robert to be more than human he has no children and he'd like a child above anything else on earth i've known that for years ever since it became apparent that none was coming to nancy ellen i hadn't given the matter a thought but if i had been thinking i would have thought that as soon as was proper he would select a strong healthy young woman and make her his wife i know his mother is homesick and wants to go back to her daughters and their children which is natural i haven't an objection in the world to him marrying a proper woman at a proper time and place but oh dear lord i do dread and despise to see that little southy cat come back and catch him because she knows how did you ever see her mother no i never said kate and i hope i never shall i know what nancy ellen felt because she told me all about it that time we were up north i'm trying with all my might to have a christian spirit i swallowed mrs peters and never blinked that anybody saw but i don't i truly don't know from where i could muster grace to treat a woman decently who tried to do to my sister what i know mrs southey tried to do to nancy ellen she planned to break up my sister's home that i know now that nancy ellen is gone i feel to-night as if i just couldn't endure to see mrs southey marry robert bet she does it said adam did you see her asked kate see her cried adam i saw her half a dozen times in an hour she's in the heart of the town nothing to do but dress and motor never saw such a peach of a car i couldn't help looking at it gee i wish i could get you one like that what did you think of her looks asked kate might pretty said adam promptly small but not tiny plump but not fat pink light curls big baby blue eyes and a sort of hesitating way about her as if she were anxious to do the right thing but feared she might not and wished somebody would take care of her kate threw out her hands with a rough exclamation i get the picture she said it's a dead center shot that gets a man every time no man cares a picayune about a woman who can take care of herself and help him with his job if he has a ghost of a chance at a little pink and white clinger who will suck the life and talent out of him like the parasite she is while she makes him believe he is on the job taking care of her you can rest assured it will be settled before christmas kate had been right in her theories concerning the growing of blue ribbon corn at the county fair in late september adam exhibited such heavy ears of evenly grained white and yellow corn that the blue ribbon he carried home was not an award of the judges it was a concession to the just demands of the exhibit then they began husking their annual crop it had been one of the country's best years for corn the long even golden ears they were stripping the husks from and stacking in heaps over the field might profitably have been used for seed by any farmer they had divided the field in halves and adam was husking on one side kate the other she had a big shock open and kneeling beside it she was busy stripping open the husks and heaping up the yellow ears beside her the shocks stood like rows of stationed sentinels above the crisp october sunshine warmed the air to a delightful degree around the field the fence rows were filled with purple and rose-coloured asters and everywhere goldenrod yellower than the corn was hanging in heavy heads of pollen spraying bloom on her old pink quilt little paul sound asleep was lifted from the shade of one shock to another while kate worked across her share of the field as she worked she kept looking at the child she frankly adored her but she kept her reason and held to rigid rules in feeding bathing and dressing paul minded even a gesture or a nod above the flocking larks pierced the air with silver notes on the fence rows the gathering robins called to each other high in the air the old black vulture that homed in a hollow log in kate's woods 
looked down on the spots of color made by the pink quilt the gold corn the blue of kate's dress and her yellow head an artist would have paused long over the rich color the grouping and perspective of that picture while the hazy fall atmosphere softened and blended the whole kate herself never had appeared or felt better she worked rapidly often glancing across the field to see if she was even with or slightly in advance of adam she said it would never do to let the boy get heady so she made a point of keeping even with him and caring for little paul for good measure she was smiling as she watched him working like a machine as he ripped open husks gave the ear a twist tossed it aside and reached for the next kate was doing the same thing quite as automatically she was beginning to find the afternoon sun almost hot on her bare head so she turned until it fell on her back her face was flushed to coral pink and framed in a loose border of her beautiful hair she was smiling at the thought of how adam was working to get ahead of her smiling because little paul looked such a picture of healthy loveliness smiling because she was so well she felt super abundant health rising like a stimulating tide in her body smiling because the corn was the finest she ever had seen in a commonly cultivated field smiling because she and adam were of one accord about everything smiling because the day was very beautiful because her heart was at peace her conscience clear she heard a car stop at her gate saw a man alight and start across the yard toward the field and knew that her visitor had seen her and was coming to her kate went on husking corn and when the man swung over the fence of the field she saw that he was robert and instantly thought of mrs southey so she ceased to smile i've got a big notion to tell him what i think of him she said to herself even as she looked up to greet him instantly she saw that he had come for something what is it she asked agatha he said she's been having some severe heart attacks lately and she just gave me a real scare instantly kate forgot everything except agatha whom she cordially liked and robert who appeared older more tired and worried than she had ever seen him she thought agatha had given him a real scare and she decided that it scarcely would have been bad enough to put lines in his face she had never noticed before dark circles under his eyes a look of weariness in his bearing she doubted as she looked at him if he were really courting mrs southey even as she thought of these things she was asking she's better now yes easier but she suffered terribly adam was upset completely adam three d and susan and their families are away from home and won't be back for a few days unless i send for them they went to ohio to visit some friends i stopped to ask if it would be possible for you to go down this evening and sleep there so that if there did happen to be a recurrence adam wouldn't be alone of course said kate glancing at the baby i'll go right away no need for that he said if you'll arrange to stay with adam tonight as a precaution you needn't go till bedtime i'm going back after supper to put them in shape for the night i'm almost sure she'll be all right now but you know how frightened we can get about those we love yes i know said kate quietly going straight on ripping open ear after ear of corn presently she wondered why he did not go she looked up at him and met his eyes he was studying her intently kate was vividly conscious in an instant of her bare wind-teased head her husking gloves she was not at all sure that her face was clean she smiled at him and picking up the sunbonnets lying beside her she wiped her face with the skirt if the sun hits too long on the same spot it grows warm she told him kate i do wish you wouldn't he exclaimed abruptly kate was too forthright for sparring why not she asked for one thing you are doing a man's work he said for another i hate to see you burn the loveliest hair i ever saw on the head of a woman and coarsen your fine skin 
Kate looked down at the ear of corn she held in her hands, and considered an instant. "'There hasn't any man been around asking to relieve me of this work,' she said. "'I got my start in life doing a man's work, and I'm frank to say that I'd far rather do it any day than what is usually considered a woman's. As for my looks, I never set a price on them or let them interfere with business, Robert.' "'No, I know you don't,' he said, "'but it's a pity to spoil you.' "'I don't know what's the matter with you,' said Kate patiently. She bent her head toward him. "'Feel,' she said, "'and see if my hair isn't soft and fine. "'I always cover it in really burning sun. "'This autumn haze is good for it. "'My complexion is exactly as smooth and even now "'as it was the day I first met you on the footlog over twenty years ago. "'There's one good thing about the Bates women. "'They wear well. "'None of us yet have ever faded and frazzled out. "'Have you got many Hartley women doing what you call woman's work "'to compare with me physically, Robert?' "'You know the answer to that,' he said. "'So I do,' said Kate. "'I see some of them occasionally.' when business calls me that way. Now, Robert, I'm so well, I feel like running a foot race the first thing when I wake up every morning. I'm making money. I'm starting my boy in a safe, useful life. Have you many year-and-a-half babies in your practice that can beat little Paul? I'm as happy as it's humanly possible for me to be without Mother and Polly and Nancy Ellen." Mother used always to say that when death struck a family, it seldom stopped until it took three. That was my experience, and saving Adam and little Paul, it took my three dearest, but the separation isn't going to be so very long. If I were you, I wouldn't worry about me, Robert. There are many women in the world willing to pay for your consideration. Save it for them. Kate, I'm sorry I said anything, he said hastily. I wouldn't offend you purposely, you know. Kate looked at him in surprise. But I'm not offended, she said, snapping an ear and reaching for another. I am merely telling you. Don't give me a thought. I'm all right. If you'll save me an hour the next time little Paul has a tooth coming through, you'll have completely earned my gratitude. Tell Agatha I'll come as soon as I finish my evening work. That was clearly a dismissal. For Kate, glancing across the field toward Adam, saw that he had advanced to a new shock, so she began husking faster than before. End of chapter 27 Recording by Campbell Shelp Chapter 28 of A Daughter of the Land This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Campbell Shelp. A Daughter of the Land by Jean Stratton Porter. Chapter 28. The Eleventh Hour. Robert said goodbye and started back towards his car. Kate looked after him as he reached the fence. A surge of pity for him swept up in her heart. He seemed far from happy, and he surely was very tired. Impulsive as always, she lifted her clear voice and called, Robert! He paused with his foot on a rail of the fence and turned toward her. Have you had any dinner? she asked. He seemed to be considering. Come to think of it, I don't believe I have, he said. I thought you looked neglected, said Kate. Sonny across the field is starting a shock ahead of me. I can't come, but go to the kitchen. The door is unlocked. You'll find fried chicken and some preserves and pickles in the pantry. The bread box is right there, and the milk and butter are in the spring house. He gave Kate one long look. Thank you, he said, and leaped the fence. He stopped on the front walk and stood a minute. Then he turned and went around the house. She laughed aloud. She was sending him to chicken perfectly cooked, barely cold, melon preserves, 
pickled cucumbers and bread like that which had for years taken a county fair prize each fall butter yellow as the golden rod lining the fences and cream stiff enough to stand alone also he would find neither germ nor mould in her pantry and spring house while it would be a new experience for him to let him wait on himself kate husked away in high good humour but she quit an hour early to be on time to go to agatha she explained this to adam when she told him that he would have to milk alone while she bathed and dressed herself and got supper when she began to dress kate examined her hair minutely and combed it with unusual care if robert was at agatha's when she got there she would let him see that her hair was not sunburned and ruined to match the hair dressing she reached back in her closet and took down her second best white dress she was hoping that agatha would be well enough to have a short visit kate worked so steadily that she seldom saw any of her brothers and sisters during the summer in winter she spent a day with each of them if she could possibly manage anyway agatha would like to see her appearing well so she put on the plain snowy linen and carefully pinning a big apron over it she went to the kitchen they always had a full dinner at noon and worked until dusk her bath had made her later than she intended to be dusk was deepening evening chill was beginning to creep into the air she closed the door fed little pull and rolled her into bed set the potatoes boiling and began mixing the biscuit she had them just ready to roll when steam lifted the lid of the potato pot with the soft dough in her hand she took a step to right it while it was in her fingers she peered into the pot she did not look up on the instant the door opened because she thought it would be adam when she glanced toward the door she saw robert standing looking at her he had stepped inside closed the door and with his hand on the knob was waiting for her to see him oh hello said kate i thought it was adam have you been to agatha's yet yes she is very much better he said i only stopped to tell you that her mother happened to come out for the night and they'll not need you i'm surely glad she is better said kate but i'm rather disappointed i've been swimming and i'm all ready to go she set the pot lid in place accurately and gave her left hand a deft turn to save the dough from dripping she glanced from it to robert expecting to see him open the door and disappear instead he stood looking at her intently suddenly he said kate will you marry me kate mechanically saved the dough again as she looked at the pot an instant then she said casually sure it would be splendid to have a doctor right in the house when little pole cuts her double teeth thank you said robert tersely no doubt that would be a privilege but i decline to marry you in order to see little pole safely through teething good night he stepped outside and closed the door very completely and somewhat pronouncedly kate stood straight an instant then realized biscuit dough was slowly creeping down her wrist with a quick fling she shot the mass into the scrap bucket and sinking on the chair she sat on to peel vegetables she lifted her apron laid her head on her knees and gave a big gulping sob or two then she began to cry silently a minute later the door opened again that time it had to be adam but kate did not care what he saw or what he thought she cried on in perfect abandon then steps crossed the room someone knelt beside her put an arm around her and said kate why are you crying kate lifted her head suddenly and applied her apron skirt none of your business she said to robert's face six inches from hers are you so anxious as all this about little paul's teeth he asked oh drat little paul's teeth cried kate the tears rolling uninterruptedly then why did you say that to me he demanded well you said you only stopped to tell me that i needn't go to agatha's she explained i had to say something to get even with you 
Oh, said Robert, and took possession. Kate put her arms around his neck, drew his head against hers, and knew a minute of complete joy. When Adam entered the house, his mother was very busy. She was mixing more biscuit dough. She was laughing like a girl of sixteen. She snatched out one of their finest tablecloths and put on many extra dishes for supper, while Uncle Robert, looking like a different man, was helping her. He was actually stirring the gravy and getting the water and setting up chairs. And he was under high tension, too. He was saying things of no moment, as if they were profound wisdom, and laughing hilariously at things that were scarcely worth a smile. Adam looked on, and marveled, and all the while his irritation grew. At last he saw a glance of understanding pass between them. He could endure it no longer. "'Oh, you might as well say what you think,' he burst forth. "'You forgot to pull down the blinds.' Both the brazen creatures laughed as if that were a fine joke. They immediately threw off all reserve. By the time the meal was finished, Adam was struggling to keep from saying the meanest things he could think of. Also, he had to go to Millie, with nothing very definite to tell. But when he came back, his mother was waiting for him. She said at once, "'Adam, I'm very sorry the blind was up tonight. I wanted to talk to you.' and tell you myself that the first real love for a man that I have ever known is in my heart tonight. Why, mother, said Adam. It's true, said Kate quietly. You see, Adam, the first time I ever saw Robert Gray, I knew, and he knew, that he had made a mistake in engaging himself to Nancy Ellen. But the thing was done, she was happy. We simply realized that we would have done better together, and let it go at that. But all these years I have known that I could have made him a wife who would have come closer to his ideals than my sister, and she should have the man who wanted to marry me. They would have had a wonderful time together. And where did my father come in? asked Adam quietly. He took advantage of my blackest hour, said Kate. I married him when I positively didn't care what happened to me. The man I could have loved was married to my sister. The man I could have married and lived with in comfort to both of us was out of the question. It was in the Bates' blood to marry about the time I did. I had seen only the very best of your father, and he was an attractive lover, not bad-looking, not embarrassed with one single scruple. It's the way of the world. I took it. I paid for it. Only God knows how dearly I paid. But, Adam, if you love me, stand by me now. Let me have this eleventh hour, happiness, with no alloy. Anything I feel for your Uncle Robert has nothing in the world to do with my being your mother, with you being my son. Kiss me and tell me you're glad, Adam. Adam rose up and put his arms around his mother. All his resentment was gone. He was happy as he could be for his mother, and happier than he ever before had been for himself. The following afternoon, Kate took the car and went to see Agatha instead of husking corn. She dressed with care and arrived about three o'clock, leading Pole in whitest white, with cheeks still rosy from her afternoon nap. Agatha was sitting up and delighted to see them. She said they were the first of the family who had come to visit her, and she thought they had come because she was thinking of them. Then she told Kate about her illness. She said it dated from Father Bates' stroke, and the dreadful days immediately following, when Adam had completely lost self-control, and she had not been able to influence him. "'I think it broke my heart,' she said simply. Then they talked the family over, and at last Agatha said, "'Kate, what is this I hear about Robert?' Have you been informed that Mrs. Southey is back in Hartley, and that she is working every possible chance in using multifarious blandishments on him? Kate laughed heartily and suddenly. She never had heard blandishments used in common conversation. As she struggled to regain self-possession, Agatha spoke again. "'It's no laughing matter,' she said. 
The report has every earmark of verisimilitude. The Bates family has a way of feeling deeply. We all loved Nancy Ellen. We all suffered severely and lost something that never could be replaced when she went. Of course, all of us realized that Robert would enter the bonds of matrimony again. None of us would have objected, even if he remarried soon. But all of us do object to his marrying a woman who would have broken Nancy Ellen's heart if she could. And yesterday I took advantage of my illness and told him so. Then I asked him why a man of his standing and ability in this community didn't frustrate that unprincipled creature's vermiculations toward him by marrying you at once. Slowly Kate sank down in her chair. Her face whitened and then grew greenish. She breathed with difficulty. "'Oh, Agatha!' was all she could say. "'I do not regret it,' said Agatha. "'If he is going to ruin himself, he is not going to do it without knowing that the Bates family highly disapprove of his course.' "'But why drag me in?' said Kate, almost too shocked to speak at all. "'Maybe he loves Mrs. Southey.' She has let him see how she feels about him. Possibly he feels the same about her. He does, if he weds her, said Agatha conclusively. Anything anyone could say or do would have no effect, if he had centered his affections upon her, of that you may be very sure. May I? asked Kate dully. Indeed you may, said Agatha. The male of the species, when he is a man of Robert's attainments and calibre, can be swerved from pursuit of the female he covets, by nothing save extinction. You mean, said Kate with an effort, that if Robert asked a woman to marry him, it would mean that he loved her? Indubitably, cried Agatha. Kate laughed until she felt a little better, but she went home in a mood far different from that in which she started. Then she had been very happy, and she had intended to tell Agatha about her happiness, the very first of all. Now she was far from happy. Possibly a thousand things, the most possible, that Robert had responded to Agatha's suggestion, and stopped and asked her that abrupt question, from an impulse as sudden and inexplicable as had possessed her when she married George Holt. Kate fervently wished she had gone to the cornfield as usual that afternoon. "'That's the way it goes,' she said angrily as she threw off her better dress and put on her everyday gingham to prepare supper. "'That's the way it goes. Stay in your element and go on with your work and you're all right. Leave your job and go traipsing over the country, wasting your time, and you get a heartache to pay you. I might as well give up the idea that I'm ever to be happy like anybody else.' Every time I think happiness is coming my way, along comes something that knocks it higher than Gilderoy's kite. Hang the luck! She saw Robert pass while she was washing the dishes, and knew he was going to Agatha's, and would stop when he came back. She finished her work, put Little Pole to bed, and made herself as attractive as she knew how in her prettiest blue dress. All the time she debated whether she would say anything to him about what Agatha had said or not. She decided she would wait a while and watch how he acted. She thought she could soon tell. So when Robert came, she was as nearly herself as possible, but when he began to talk about being married soon, the most she would say was that she would begin to think about it at Christmas and tell him by spring. Robert was bitterly disappointed. He was very lonely. He needed better housekeeping than his aged mother was capable of, to keep him up to a high mark in his work. Neither of them was young any longer. He could see no reason why they should not be married at once. Of the reason in Kate's mind, he had not a glimmering. But Kate had her way. She would not even talk of a time, or express an opinion as to whether she would remain on the farm, or live in Nancy Ellen's house, or sell it and build whatever she wanted for herself. Robert went away baffled, and disappointed over some intangible thing he could not understand. For six weeks Kate tortured herself and kept Robert from being happy. Then one morning Agatha stopped to visit with her while Adam drove on to town. After they had exhausted farming, little Paul's charms and the neighbors, 
Agatha looked at Kate and said, "'Catherine, what is this I hear about Robert coming here every day now? It appeals to me that he must have followed my advice. Of course, he never would have thought of coming if you hadn't told him so,' said Kate dryly. "'Now there you are in error,' said the literal Agatha, as she smoothed down little Pole's skirts and twisted her ringlets into formal corkscrews. "'Right there you are in error, my dear. The reason I told Robert to marry you was because he said to me, when he suggested going after you to stay the night with me, that he had seen you in the field when he passed, and that you were the most glorious specimen of womanhood that he ever had seen.' He said you were the one to stay with me, in case there should be any trouble, because your head was always level and your heart was as big as a barrel. Yes, that's the reason I can't always have it with me, said Kate, looking glorified instead of glorious. Agatha, it just happens to mean very much to me. Will you just kindly begin at the beginning and tell me every single word Robert said to you and you said to him that day? "'Why, I have informed you explicitly,' said Agatha, using her handkerchief on the toe of Pole's blue shoe. "'He mentioned going after you, and said what I told you, and I told him to go. "'He praised you so highly that when I spoke to him about the Southy woman I remembered it, "'so I suggested to him, as he seemed to think so well of you. "'It just that minute flashed into my mind, but he made me think of it, calling you glorious and level-headed and big-hearted. Heavens! Catherine Eleanor, what more could you ask? I guess that should be enough, said Kate. One certainly would presume so, said Agatha. Then Adam came and handed Kate her mail as she stood beside his car talking to him a minute, while Agatha settled herself. As Kate closed the gate behind her, she saw a big, square white envelope among the newspapers, advertisements, and letters. She slipped it out and looked at it intently. Then she ran her finger under the flap and read the contents. She stood studying the few lines it contained, frowning deeply. "'Doesn't it beat the band?' she asked of the surrounding atmosphere. She went up the walk, entered the living room, slipped the letter under the lid of the big family Bible, and walking to the telephone, she called Dr. Gray's office. He answered the call in person. "'Robert, this is Kate,' she said. "'Would you have any deeply rooted objections to marrying me at six o'clock this evening?' "'Well, I should say not,' boomed Robert's voice, the not coming so forcibly Kate dodged. "'Have you got the information necessary for a license?' she asked. "'Yes.' he answered. Then bring one and your minister and come at six, she said. And, oh, yes, Robert, will it be all right with you if I stay here and keep house for Adam until he and Millie can be married and move in? Then I'll come to your house just as it is. I don't mind coming to Nancy Ellen's home as I would any other woman's. Surely, he cried, any arrangement you make will satisfy me. "'All right, I'll expect you with the document and the minister at six, then,' said Kate, and hung up the receiver. Then she took it down again, and, calling Millie, asked her to bring her best white dress and come up right away and help her get ready to entertain a few people that evening. Then she called her sister Hannah and asked her if she thought that in the event she, Kate, wished that— evening at six o'clock to marry a fine man and had no preparations whatever made her family would help her out to the extent of providing the supper she wanted all of them and all the children but the arrangement had come up suddenly and she could not possibly prepare a supper herself for such a big family in the length of time she had hannah said she was perfectly sure every one of them would drop everything and be tickled to pieces to bring the supper and to come and they would have a grand time. What did Kate want? Oh, she wanted bread and chicken for meat, maybe some potato chips, and Angel's food cake, and a big freezer or two of Agatha's best ice cream, and she thought possibly more butter and coffee than she had on hand. She had plenty of sugar and cream and pickles and jelly. She would have the tables all set as she did for Christmas." Then Kate rang for Adam and put a broom in his hand as he entered the back door. 
she met milly with a pail of hot water and cloths to wash the glass she went to her room and got out her best afternoon dress of dull blue with gold lace and a pink velvet rose she shook it out and studied it she had worn it twice on the trip north none of them save adam had ever seen it she put it on and looked at it critically then she called milly and they changed the neck and sleeves a little took a yard of width from the skirt and behold it became a creation in the very height of style then kate opened her trunk and got out the petticoat hose and low shoes to match it and laid them on her bed then they set the table laid a fire ready to strike in the cook stove saw that the gas was all right set out the big coffee boiler and skimmed a crock full of cream by four o'clock they could think of nothing else to do then kate bathed and went to her room to dress adam and milly were busy making themselves fine little pole sat in her prettiest dress watching her beloved tate until adam came and took her he had been instructed to send robert and the minister to his mother's room as soon as they came kate was trying to look her best yet making haste so that she would be ready on time she had made no arrangements except to spread a white goatskin where she and robert would stand at the end of the big living-room near her door before she was fully dressed she began to hear young voices and knew that her people were coming when she was ready kate looked at herself and muttered i'll give robert and all of them a good surprise this is a real dress thanks to nancy ellen the poor girl it's scarcely fair to her to marry her man in a dress she gave me but i'd stake my life she'd rather i'd have him than any other woman it was an evening of surprises at six adam lighted a big log festooned with leaves and berries so that the flames roared and crackled up the chimney the early arrivals were the young people who had hung the mantel gas fixtures curtain poles and draped the doors with long sprays of bittersweet northern holly and great branches of red spice berries dogwood with its red leaves and berries and scarlet and yellow oak leaves the elders followed and piled the table with heaps of food then trailed red vines between dishes in a quandary as to what to wear without knowing what was expected of him further than saying i will at the proper moment robert ended by slipping into kate's room dressed in white flannel the ceremony was over at ten minutes after six kate was lovely robert was handsome everyone was happy the supper was a banquet the bates family went home adam disappeared with milly while little pole went to sleep left to themselves robert took kate in his arms and tried to tell her how much he loved her but felt he expressed himself poorly as she stood before him he said and now dear tell me what changed you and why we are married to-night instead of at christmas or in the spring oh yes said kate i almost forgot why i wanted you to answer a letter for me lucid said robert he seated himself beside the table bring on the ink and stationery and let me get it over kate obeyed and with the writing material laid down the letter she had that morning received from john jardine telling her that his wife had died suddenly and that as soon as he had laid her away he was coming to exact a definite promise from her as to the future and that he would move heaven and earth before he would again be disappointed robert read the letter and laid it down his face slowing flushing scarlet you called me out here and married me expressly to answer this he demanded of course said kate i thought if you could tell him that his letter came the day i married you it would stop his coming and not be such a disappointment to him robert pushed the letter from him violently and arose bye he checked himself and stared at her kate you don't mean that he cried tell me you don't mean that why sure i do said kate it gave me a fine excuse i was so homesick for you and tired waiting to begin life with you agatha told me about her telling you the day she was ill to marry me and the reason i wouldn't was because i thought maybe you had asked me so offhand like because she told you to and you didn't really love me then this morning she was here and we were talking and she got round it again and then she told me all you said and i saw you did love me 
and that you would have asked me if she hadn't said anything and i wanted you so badly robert ever since that day we met on the footlog i've known that you were the only man i'd ever really want to marry robert i've never come anywhere near loving anybody else the minute agatha told me this morning i began to think how i could take back what i'd been saying how i could change and right then adam handed me that letter and it gave me a fine way out and so i called you sure i married you to answer that robert now go and do it all right he said in a minute then he walked to her and took her in his arms again but kate could not understand why he was laughing until he shook when he kissed her